Hi everyone, my name is Danny Candelora and I'm an archaeologist and historian specializing in ancient Egypt. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of ancient Mediterranean history at SUNY Cortland. Welcome to People in the Past. So what topic are we talking about today? Today we'll be talking about the Hyksos immigration and identity in ancient Egypt. And first things first, uh, who are the Hyksos. <laughs> Hyksos, uh, the word Hyksos is just the Greek version of an Egyptian title, um, Hekahasi, meaning rulers of foreign lands. And these were Semitic people coming from Southwest Asia. So modern Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, that kind of region. They ruled the North of Egypt from their capital at Avaris or Tel Aldaba um, between about 1650 and 1550 BCE. We know from the archaeological record that waves of immigrants from Southwest Asia had been moving into the Eastern Delta of Egypt, starting even in the previous period, the Middle Kingdom. And just like today, they were relocating for economic opportunities, doing the jobs the natives didn't want to do, um, like mining expeditions to the Sinai Peninsula or maritime trade in the Mediterranean. Yet they, like their eventual rulers, the Hyksos, get a terrible rap in the Egyptian sources. And just to further complicate the picture, at the same time the Hyksos are ruling in the north, there's a native Egyptian dynasty ruling in the south from the city of Thebes. Um, they're going to eventually start a war to expel the Hyksos from Egypt. And it's uh, Egyptian sources from their perspective um, that have been used to write the history of this period. Now, having done my PhD in LA, I, I always wondered why no one had made a movie out of this period because the Egyptian texts really read like a bad Hollywood screenplay. Um, you can see our cast of characters. In the north, we have Apepi, the despotic Hyksos ruler. Um, and at Thebes, we have that heroic Egyptian family that are fighting to sort of liberate Egypt, right? That's the um, uh, theme that they set. Kamos, uh, one of the Theban kings, made a, a couple of stela that record the war for reunification. Um, and in these Egyptian sources, the Hyksos are very much cast as the bad guys. They are considered to be a barbaric group from the east who violently invade and cause chaos and destruction. And then that narrative gets sort of magnified over time. So we see in later historical sources uh, in this case, from the third century BCE, um, that they're really playing up this, this narrative of invasion and destruction. But we have no archaeological evidence for these destructions, and it's actually much more likely that the Hyksos gained power in the north as the centralized Egyptian state collapsed and really retreated to Thebes, so no invasion involved. Instead, what we do have evidence for is a multi-ethnic community living together peacefully in the Delta, intermarrying and blending cultural traditions under Hyksos rule. So what sources do I look at? Um, because the evidence for the Hyksos is so fragmentary, we actually have to get pretty creative and use everything we can find to talk about these kings and their immigrant subjects. So I get to dabble in text, art, and archaeology. For the texts, right, those, those Theban sources from the Egyptian perspective, if we read them carefully, they're actually riddled with details that seem strongly at odds with the expected sort of pro-Theban narrative. Um, for example, uh, this stila starts with the king's council urging him not to go to war with the Hyksos. And you can see this portion is clearly suggesting that Thebes is enjoying beneficial trade and grazing agreements with the Delta. Um, so we're seeing Delta-grown agricultural products being sent south and Theban livestock being sent north to use the prime grazing lands in the Delta. There's not even any mention of payment for these benefits. They seem to have been free perks, kind of like a diplomatic gift exchange type of thing. 
Really interestingly, uh, in the blue, you'll see that the council is trying to placate the king by saying, you know, it's fine. We still have Egypt. He has the land of the Southwest Asian, amazingly dismissing the North um, as a foreign land. In the second stila, we see a, a much more expected sort of move on the, on the part of the Thetan authors. So all of the writings of the Hyksos of Pepe's name not only lack a cartouche, uh, which is this oval symbol that usually surrounds Egyptian kings' names, um, but they're classified by a bound enemy sign, uh, this little guy, instead of symbols of kingship. This makes a lot more sense in such a propagandistic text, right? You can still name the enemy while you invalidate them. But even in these instances, Apepi still receives the Sa-Ra title, uh, which means son of Ray, the sun god, uh, a detail which provides him not only with legitimacy uh, as a ruler, but also implicit divinity and divine backing. So again, a really curious choice for such a propagandistic text. When it comes to the archeological evidence, um, most scholars have actually approached this issue uh, using the concept of Egyptianization. This is a process where immigrants could be considered Egyptians if they would adapt to Egyptian society and function within sort of expected social roles. Uh, basically just become as Egyptian as possible. The problem with this approach is that it kind of assumes that Egyptian culture is the superior one and that any Im immigrant would, by default, want to become totally Egyptian. So few studies have looked at how or why immigrants would maintain their origins or allow for any influence of the outside culture on Egypt. It's really important to remember that the Eastern Delta was a unique cultural and geographic context that was in constant contact with Southwest Asia. So I started looking uh, more into immigration theory and found that what we're really seeing on the ground is a process called integration. Lots of mutual accommodation, cultural blending, um, and immigrants maintaining their foreign identity. We have a lot of funerary evidence uh, showing that, that purposeful maintenance and even the like, public advertisement of, of people's foreign origins. Uh, so this is a really famous burial from Tal Daba. Uh, the body is buried in a flex position. That's much more common in Southwest Asia. Um, and he also has several donkeys, uh, which you can see just to the left of his tomb. Um, having donkeys buried with you is a super strange thing in Egypt um, and would have been a strong public marker of your foreign identity, right? So someone had to sacrifice these animals at his funeral, it would have been a public act. These immigrants are also maintaining their personal styles or their cultural styles, right? So their colorful styles of dress um, and their characteristic mushroom haircuts, especially among the men. Archaeologically, we find a ton of uh, foreign weapons, so weapon forms that originate in Southwest Asia, and these also serve as strong external indicators of a person's origins in that reason. You can see this fellow with his mushroom hair um, is actually holding a ductile axe, the same as um, We also have Southwest Asian religions, right? So this cylinder seal shows the Southwest Asian storm god Baal uh, as protector of sailors and overlord of the sea. And you can see, notice the little mushroom haircuts uh, on the sailors in the boat. And of course, beyond this intentional maintenance and advertisement, we also start to see blending between Southwest Asian and local Egyptian uh, cultural traditions. Um, in the religious realm, there's a huge temple to the Egyptian god Seth built at the site, and he gets syncretized with Baal. They're both storm gods. And that syncretized hybrid god is actually still being worshipped at this site more than 400 years later. We get temples built in both Egyptian and Southwest Asian architectural styles in the same precinct. 
and tons of burials that show both maintenance and blending. For example, our friend here again, um, he initially looked very foreign to us, right? Uh, but turns out the pottery is mostly Egyptian and he was discovered with a scarab, which is an Egyptian seal um, that has an Egyptian administration title and an Egyptian name that actually means Southwest Asian. Even the pottery starts to blend, uh, which has implications for the types of food they're eating, how they're cooking it, even how they're serving it, which is, of course, um, very culturally significant. When it comes to the Hyksos themselves, they actually adapted several elements of Egyptian culture. So in this door jam of one of the Hyksos called Sekher Hair, um, it shows us that they took Egyptian titles of kingship and Egyptian throne names, but these kings never give up their Semitic personal name. Um, and in fact, Sekher Hair here uh, pulled a very clever move. He pairs his Semitic personal name with that weird Hekahasu title um, and then puts it in a cartouche. Again, a very Egyptian symbol of kingship. Even their administration shows accommodation strategies for both Egyptians and immigrants. They continue to use Egyptian administration practices, the Egyptian language, Egyptian seals, titles, et cetera. But they simplify the bureaucracy down uh, into a more of a Southwest Asian style of governance based on kinship ties, which you can, can see reflected in um, the Semitic names of a lot of these officials. They also kept in touch with their fellow Southwest Asian rulers in ways that were traditional to Southwest Asia. They wrote letters to each other in cuneiform and they sent each other diplomatic gifts like statues. This links them, of course, to powerful political allies, um, but also to lucrative trade markets, which are going to further bolster their rule in Egypt. And then in terms of really like broadcasting and advertising that Eastern identity, um, one of the more brazen declaration comes from the monumental buildings at uh, Avaris. Under the Hyksos, they were built completely in Southwest Asian architectural style. The cityscape of Tel Adaba would have rendered it instantly recognizable as Southwest Asian or at the very least hybrid. Just like the major architecture of Ptolemaic Alexandria would have been unmistakably Greek, um, or you might see a pagoda in a modern Chinatown. It's really meant to send a sign of kinship and belonging with their culture of origin. So how can this topic uh, tell us about real people in the past? Like a lot of the podcasts in the series, I think this research really tells us first and foremost that people were people, um, just like us. And there are a lot of important parallels that can be drawn between the ancient world and what's going on in the world today. So especially recently with uh, issues about the US border wall, Brexit, uh, and even COVID-19, there's been a ton of xenophobic political rhetoric out there just like the Thebans put out about the Hyksos. But these ancient Southwest Asian immigrants, they moved to Egypt for better lives, they did unappealing jobs, and they slowly gained wealth and social status. And just like established immigrant communities in modern cities, they lived comfortably with their Egyptian neighbors, they blended families and traditions, and in the process, they had a massive impact on Egyptian culture. So thank you for watching. For more videos, please check out peopleinthepast.com.